Please welcome Dr. Misha Willett. Thanks, Jeremiah, and for the introduction, and thanks um, all the student volunteers who I know came out here to help make this happen, and thanks for coming. Um, I, one time I was at a conference, and I gave a talk literally to two people. <laughs> I had flown to Boston to give this paper, paid for my own hotel room, and I got all amped up, practiced it, etc., etc. Two people. A room about four times the size of this one. Um, I must have felt for a second. They come in. All right, where's, do we have the wrong time? Nope. That's just who's interested in your work, my friend. Um, that's how that went. So this is an overwhelming response. <laughs> I, uh, I've never not read a paper at a conference, though. Usually I, I get a piece of paper, and I stand, and I shiver a little bit, and I read. Um, but it seems to me that diversity of expertise in a room like this, that wouldn't make sense. Um, I'd have to interrupt myself every couple sentences to explain something or tell a diverting story. Um, so I'm mostly going to talk at you, but I did make this outline, and sometimes those can kind of chain you uh, a little bit. Um, I, I just want to say some things about possible responses to suffering. Um, and what a weirdly, sadly appropriate day to be doing it, actually. Um, I don't know why it bothers me so much when the flags are at half mass. I, every time that happens, I, I go to ask somebody, and usually people don't know. Like, hey, does anybody know why the flags are at half mass and nobody, nobody does? I think there should be an app. Like, you know, you could take a picture of it and it would geotag your location and tell you who died recently in that place or what. Um, I don't know how art might be helpful somehow. Not how we can turn suffering into an art. That's not what I'm on about. But how art responds to suffering in a way that might be helpful thereby, um, and the limits of that. I want to look at a poem about psychological strife uh, by a poet called Sidney Dobell. Um, because none of you have ever heard of him, I want to say some, some things about the school that spawned uh, the movement, um, and, uh, and then about his life, and then I'll get on to the, the poem that we're about. Sidney Dobell is one of the spasmodics, and as Jeremiah said, that's kind of my wheelhouse right now. It's a group of poets that I'm working on. My book is called The Last Romantics, Britain's Spasmodic Poets. So they're, they're sort of the end of the spasmodic tradition, the beginning of the Victorian tradition. Um, they all write in, in epic. They're all young, working class people mostly. And um, they write these enormous, kind of prideful books about poets who are awesome and who are conspicuously just like their authors. <laughs> like they're about some dude who has blonde hair, like me, you know. It's, um, <laughs> And he's just the best thing that's ever happened to humankind. Uh, but the thing, the thing I have to tell you is that this, this was the biggest poet, poetic movement, probably including the Romantics, that had ever happened um, in, in British literature. And so it's weird that you've never heard them. Not like you haven't read broadly enough and so just missed that lecture. No one gave you that lecture because even scholars of Victorian literature don't know about the poetry of the spasmodics. Um, the figures are, in case you want to search around in the memory banks, Alexander Smith, Philip James Bailey, Sidney Dobell, and John Stanley Big. They are tracking from Goethe and Novalis um, in Germany and Edward Young in the Enlightenment in, in Britain. Um, phenomenally popular stuff. People just called it the new poetry. There was poetry, and then the whole thing changed with the spasmodics. So we're talking 1851, it sort of takes off in force. The other crazy thing about this movement is it happened everywhere, all at once. Um, it's, it's an indicator of the speed of modern global exchange. Alexander Smith's book, for example, comes out in 1853. By 1854, there are lecture tours in Australia and California about it. Now just think for a second about that. This is before the transatlantic cable goes in. I mean, someone published a book by a 20-year-old. He's 20. It word travels, I don't they put it on a sailboat, drove it over to America. That's my sailing term. They drive sailboats over to America. Um, modern fellow. Uh, reprint it illegally, usually, in Philadelphia printing houses, then send it by steamship up to Missouri, right? Put it on a Conestoga wagon, what, in St. Louis? My geography's a little rusty, but something happens like that. They cart it by ox to California, and then people are gathering like this to discuss this important and great new poem within one year of its publication. 
<laughs> that's, that's amazing to me. Um, and, and everybody hailed it as the best thing that had happened since Shakespeare. That's it. I would be offended if I were an English major and yeah, someone had said, there was, there was Shakespeare and then there's this guy and I never heard of that guy. Yeah. That, seemed, that seems like a problem. Um, but the reason, the reason you haven't ever heard of them is because they were selling like hotcakes. I mean, you've heard Alfred Lord Tennyson, yeah? yeah? Spasmodics, 20 years old, are out selling them something like five to one. I have a, the, the, we have the cost books for the printers, and so we know, we know the kind of statistics. Five to one, um, and no one's buying poor Matthew Arnold's books. Uh, fewer people still Robert Browning's books until he gets married to the sexy and intelligent Elizabeth Barrett Brown and things take off with the two of them. Um, anyway, those three, those three fellows, in case, I don't know what your, what your sense of this literary history is like, ended up dominating the conversation about Victorian literature, framing it, yeah? And long story short, they had a, they had a bone to pick with these, with these young hot shots who thought so much of themselves and made them look ridiculous, frankly, um, in, in, by, by selling them in this way. It's wildly, it's, it's basically modern verse before, before modern verse happens. It jumps around from topic to topic. It's hugely sensational. Um, it's erotic at times, which is only sometimes uncomfortable because they're all also Christians, which might have cost them as well in, in the great century of, of uh, religious doubt. Um, their church affiliations might have cost them as well. One of the questions that I have is, that's, that's a brief, this is the spasmodics. One of the questions I, I have is why Whenever we have a national tragedy, do we throw poems at it? It seems like we do that, right? September 11th happens, I think five anthologies came out. Good poems for hard times, poems for healing. Do poems heal? Maybe they do, I'm not saying they don't, but it's a weird, it seems not an intuitive response. A bunch of people got exploded, here's some poems. What's it gonna do? Um, I go to funerals sometimes, when you, when you get, this will keep happening to you. It's a weird world we live in, but it does. Um, well, all my grandparents died and stuff like that. People thought we should read poems at their funerals. Why do, why do people do that? My grandma didn't like poems. I'm not sure she ever heard one in her whole life. She never said one to me. She didn't like them. Here she's dead. Let's read poems in her, over her corpse. That seemed like an odd move. Um, so could you pick one, they asked me? Like, Who's it for? Um, those are the questions that are sort of behind this This research, such as it is. Um, when Walt Whitman was wondering what kind of poet he should be, he writes Sidney Dobell's description of the ideal poet in the front of his journal. That's the one reference we have. Walt Whitman, think of him. If there was ever a more egotistical, you know what I mean, <laughs> self-made man than, than uh, Walt Whitman, I don't know who he is. And, uh, and he thought, oh, no, I should be like these spasmodics. Um, Sidney Nobel is the one that I want to focus on here today. He, he was the first child of ten. Um, wow, is was right. That gives you one thing, the kind of egotism, the kind of sense that you know something other people don't know. You know something nine other people don't know, right? At least, his whole life, you go around, here's how you do it, no, 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 you do it right. And he's got that kind of teacherly quality about him, actually. Um, his family were charismatics before there was such a thing really as charismatics, at least in the Church of England. That's important to know. He's a religious outlier. Um, feelings are okay. F fainting is okay. You get yourself out of breath in that. Um, what else about him? He's ill, as most poets keep seeming to be, I don't know why, um, for most of his life, just kind of weak and, and sickly. Um, Oh yeah, they kind of, oh, so, so they, they were Christian primitivists, and they thought they should live like the apostles, they thought all of us should live like the apostles, and sh be communists, essentially, um, share everything and, and that. Uh, which, which led to, weirdly, just a historical side note, if you've ever been to a food co-op, you sort of owe it to the Dobell family, who founded the very first co-op in Britain, um, and therefore in the rest of the Western world, which... Wow, okay, that's interesting also because then the first book that Sidney Dobell writes um, and publishes is called The Roman, and he's picking a fight. He's hoping that Italy will unite and throw off their uh, Ottoman oppressors. And he says things like, fight, you mad, magnificent, foolish nation. You idiots, you're, you're, you're with a whore. He talks like a prophet, right? You're, 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 you're whoring yourself out. You have more dignity than, than you realize that you have. Um, 
That book gets read by Karl Marx, who thinks it's the best revolutionary poetry he's ever read. And then Giuseppe Mancini, I don't know if you know who that is, but uh, an Italian liberation fighter, uh, reads the book The Roman as well and thinks, all right, yeah, I mean, let's, let's fight. People talk about poetry as though it doesn't do anything in the world, you know? Or it's, or it's after the fact. Spontaneous overflow of powerful emotion right back within <laughs> tranquility. Nonsense. Um, in this case, at least, at least once, a kid, I mean, I'm not, if you're 20, it's not like you're a kid, but you know, a kid essentially wrote this book and, and Italy formed an army and fought the people. And I'm, it's not like they weren't gonna if the poem didn't exist. But rare is that poem where, that we have the actual response of the people involved. At the, at the very beginning. Anyways, he writes the Roman. Uh, he's the, the, the only poet of whom it can be said, like Byron, he awoke and found himself famous um, at, upon publication. That book comes out and instantly. Again, all, I mean, Mazzini lives in Italy. Karl Marx uh, doesn't live in England, at least yet. Like, this thing travels and rather, rather quickly. Um, and he's known everywhere. Then he comes out with a second book, which is the one I want to talk about um, mainly here. And with it, he alienates pretty much everyone. Like people, people have been looking forward to it. We have Elizabeth Bear Browning's letters to her friends. Oh my gosh, have you seen the new book from Sidney Dobell? What's he doing? When is it coming out? It finally comes out, and it's just silence. Um, <laughs> Alfred Lord Tennyson had read uh, the, the first book, The Roman, and said, I scarcely trust myself to say how much I admire it without falling into ecstasies. Tennyson is not an excitable sort with the beard and the stoutness. I mean, think, but he's going to fall down if I start to open my mouth to tell you about how much I like this book. I will freak you right out. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing from a Victorian figure like that, an establishment figure like that. And then we have his copy. Uh, a friend of mine who went to actually do this research. We have his copy of uh, this poem, Balder, that I want to talk about. Um, and it's, this is my copy, and it's pages. I'm ripping them with my finger as I read it. They're, they're uncut. You know, some books are that way. Tennyson's copy, I think he's read 12 pages, and all the rest of them are uncut. He just, he just stopped. It's like, I can't even, and, and he, he shelved the thing. Um, which is pretty much the reaction everybody had to it. So, why am I bringing up this failure of a poem? Um, it's, a, it's erased from history, and I'm not even sure it's that good. Um, but I think it can be valuable anyways. It tells you something about this movement and how how it might be helpful um, to a discussion like we're trying to have here with, with this conference. Um, I, the poem, introducing the poem, it's a fragment, that's the first thing to know. And it's not one of these clever fragments like, like Shelley makes sometimes, like what then is life, and you're supposed to wonder what else would fill the void. This one is just, he got sick and didn't finish his assignment. Or whatever. Like he's, he planned to finish it really, really, and then just didn't. Um, in such a way that it doesn't make sense now. Like, we try, you try to say what it's about, and you can only conjecture. There's a very interesting beginning. Um, and maybe eventually it all would have made sense, but, but actually probably not. Um, the name, it's called Balder, <coughs> which is the strangest. Yes, Balder. Uh, it's no reference to the, to the follicle, to the, to the male hairline situation. It's, um, it's not a reference to the god. Balder the beautiful is dead, is dead, that C.S. Lewis. I can't discern, and neither has anyone to my satisfaction, uh, why he would call this poem that. Um, except to say that he also thought that was kind of a movement, like balderism was a thing. And it has to do with believing in art too much. We suffer from excessive balderism, he said once. Impressing no one, because what's the term you can care about? <laughs> Anyways, not much happens in the poem, too. So, so there we are. I know this is a hard sell I'm giving you. It's a poem that kind of flunked, didn't get finished, isn't that good, and um, nothing much happens in it. Uh, but here's what, here's what does happen. There's a guy trying to write a poem, has an all the spasmodic um, verses, and it's huge. I mean, the whole book is just the one poem. Um, a guy's trying to write a poem, his wife is there, makes him tea and stuff like that, brings him in when he's, when he's working. They have a kid, kid dies, wife suffers, impotent husband tries to help and can't. That's all, she just, the, the whole, three quarters of the book is just one long groan of pain um, from, from the wife who's a wreck after having lost 
the kid and the poor husband trying all the ways he can to, to help somehow. How do I insert myself? What do I possibly say to make this better somehow? Um, interestingly, no one speaks to each other in the poem. It's a drama. Amy speaks, blah, 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 blah. Walter speaks, that's his name, blah, 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 blah. But no one responds. And I think that's the first valuable thing um, from, from the poem for a conference like this, because it gets us in the wheelhouse. How do we share grief? Do you know, how do you give that to somebody else? How do you take some of it from them? Surely you've been in situations like this. You see someone hurting and you think, I wish I could, right? I wish I could pull some of that off you, but, but what steps do you take? Amy, who's, who's the wife, she walks around saying things like, that I might die and be at rest, O God, that I might die and sleep the sleep of peace, that I might die and know the balm of death, cool through my limbs and all my silenced heart. That gets you near Keats's, for a time I've been half in love with, easeful death, but it's that's more than half, isn't it? It's up to the neck in love with death. I mean, it's, I just want this to happen. And so, the, what is a bystander to do? One of the options for, for Balder is, um, should I kill her? <laughs> the woman, she wants, what do you do? The wife, it's a euthanasia question, right? I mean, we're still having this discussion in some sense. She wants to die. She says it explicitly. She is of sound mind enough under some duress. Okay, fine. She wants to die. Is my responsibility as a loving husband to end this life that she hates? Freak some people right out, as you can probably imagine. Um, Alfred Lord Tennyson's friend, Arthur Henry Hallam, died. You probably heard this story, or maybe the poem that comes from it, In Memoriam. He writes, it was one of schoolyard friends, and he writes In Memoriam, which is, what, like 50 cantos of, oh God, this hurts. And that's all. There, I mean, no things occur in that poem. But it hurts again tomorrow, so he just sits down at his writing desk. Ouch! And the next day. And the next day, you know. Um, so, so people are trying to process this kind of thing. And, and In Memoriam sinks when, it, when it's published. Nobody cares. It's, it's interesting for a few pages. And then, okay, buddy, like, chin up. Like... Turn that frown upside down. You know, what do, what do you... It's just, it's, it's harrowing, it's difficult, it's heavy. Um, until Albert dies. Queen Victoria's husband, yeah? The whole nation's in mourning. And especially the queen's in mourning, from which she never recovers. I don't know if you know this Victoria character. She, she mourned the entire rest of her, her life for, um, for Albert. Um, and she loves the poem. In Memoriam helps her somehow. And she invites Tennyson to the Buckingham Palace. Um, you have to come and read this thing to us. In fact, could you come every month and read part of it to us? This is how we're going to process grief. As a royal family and thereby as a nation. Yeah, it becomes a kind of extension. Names Tennyson the Poet Laureate. Um, the rest is, is literary history anyway. She, she, it works. Somehow it works, I don't, I don't know how it works. Um, that's a word in season then, isn't it? I mean, it's not like the poem was, was any better or worse after Prince Albert died. It's just, that was the word when it was needed, right? Said the thing that needed to be said when I needed it. Um, and it hit everybody. People, were, people cried. It's hard to imagine now. I don't, we don't have a royal... They have a royal family. We don't really have a royal family we care about to the same degree. Maybe when Kennedy died, it was a little bit like that for half the people. People had pictures. They had plates of the kids in their houses. Everybody did. If you're British, you've memorized the name of all the kids, and you have pictures of them in your house. You see them every morning. Good morning, little Prince Charles. And then the dad's dead. What do you do at breakfast? You know, it's, it's there every day. It confronts you. Um... Dobell, Dobell goes on this, we are, we are not alone, um, you, you're not alone in this sort of kick in his uh, war poems. And this is in contrast, so, so he writes about war for most of his life. The Crimean War um, breaks into his uh, ego bubble. Right? He's dealing with grief and loss and pain, and probably this has to do with his own wife. They didn't lose a child, um, so far as I can discern, but she's terribly ill and he's strangely ill, more or less their whole life, so they just can't catch a break. 
that has actual biographical characters. Uh, some people write, this is a guy called Ken Bodman, and he writes about the Crimean War. He says, the dominant feature of war poetry is the process of distancing and thereby limiting the disturbing effects of war. Once you render it artistically, you don't have to confront it in the same way. It's not as raw, you know? Um, that's true of, of poems like, uh, like Tennyson again. I don't need to talk about him so much, but Charge of the Light Brigade, you know, half a league, half a league, half a league more on. What is it? Honor the Light Brigade. It's a command. You, get honoring. You're supposed to honor that Light Brigade. It's, it's what, 300 men that died because they misheard an order? Where's the honor? Um, came out thin as a shorn sheep, they say. Um, Dobell's poems, anyways, don't have that kind of distance, and I think this is, this is I mean, not overstated. It's not miraculous, but it's cool for Victorian poems to, to get at that kind of uh, directness. Um, he has a poem called Childless in the collection um, about imagining into the pain of other people. And he does it with everybody. What would it be like to be a nurse in the war? What would it be like to be a soldier? What would it be like to be an enemy soldier? Think about that. While the war is going on, he's writing anti-patriotic poems about how difficult it must be to be the enemy of them. It's, it's, it's not the done thing. We can, we can put it that way, at least. And then imagine what it would be like to be a mother who, who lost their kid in the war. He says, the son thou sentest forth is now a thought, a dream. To all but thee, he is as naught as if he had gone back into the bosom that bore him. My bad. You, you, don't, you don't have anything. The sacrifice is total. Um, not even a body remains. They, they just get a letter. You know what I mean? This happens. They don't even have glory at the end. Uh, that that pavalum of so many such sacrificers, you know, well, well, he was brave and he did his bit for his country because this is a complicated war um, and it's not 100% sure that he gets glory for what he did. He might have just made a mistake. And no one's going to remember him anyways. Hey, that's, that's the rude truth. That's stripping away the limb. Every time something bad happens, we say we will never forget, right? That's the thing. Never will we forget this. Wait, sometimes you remember a year. Some people remember their whole life if they're directly affected, but most of us, come on, 20 years, I don't know the date of the London bombing. We will never. Um, you will, is the promise. Everyone's going to forget about your dead soldier boy. Sorry, you won't, but everybody else will eventually. There's just too many of them. We can't keep up. Our memories don't work that way. The whole world, he might never have existed, um, but for the forgotten soldier's parents, it's as though that whole world ceased to exist, except that, he says, quote, the deep texture of that single weight of ground where he's buried. There's not a world anymore. There's a six foot by three foot plot. That's, that's the world. That's where their attention will be. Um, the problem is, when you're in pain, it's hard to focus on anything else. We had a toothache. <laughs> right? Try getting anything done. Anything. <laughs> Raising your family, cleaning your house, putting your clothes on. It's like, right? It's the thing. It's, it, it puts you in a prison of ego, right? It's, I, don't, I don't mean to insult people who are in pain, but you, know, you, can't, you can't not think about yourself. It's every beat of your heart is pain, pain, right? It focuses things in a way. Um, yeah. That pain puts the locus of attention on the self, and it can feel like, like this. Um, here's a bit of the actual poem from Balder. Amy says, Surely the Lord is cruel but to me, and over bounteous to the race of men, with mercy taken from my single lot. You know how messed up that is? That's not how. That's not the way it goes. Surely the Lord is cruel only to me, and over bounteous to the whole race of men. Oh yes, everybody else is happy. Everybody in the planet, just you, is the pain. But that's what pain feels like. I am the dwarf of this great family. That's the family of mankind. I'm the worst one. The favored lips do drink the wine of life, and all the mingled lees fill up my fate. I am a place where music, music meets, putting it out. All the harmony of the world contrasts with this other music, and they cancel each other out. There's nothing. By how much joy is loud, I am the darker silence. Every kid that laughs, if there's the kind of crying in me that cancels it out. I'm the zero. You know what I mean? All the lines of sorrow cross above my wretched head. 
We are grown sour with sweetness. They are proud with pleasure. They care not to keep awake, even to be happy. They go to sleep. Can you imagine people go to sleep? I'm suffering here. How can you sleep at a time like this? Because you want to share it, right? Why would you want to share it? It hurts you. Um, it sounds like that, yeah? Doesn't seem... I, I think seeing someone else talk that way can help us avoid it, though. To the prison of the ego, you know? Because what I wanted to do was correct her. Did you hear that? Yeah. No, that's not right. Surely the Lord is good to everyone else on the planet Earth except me. Mm. I know it hurts, but that's not right, dear. You know? And I think that's... It gets you, I'm not saying it recovers anything, I'm not sure how much it even helps, but it pops the bubble a little bit. It has to, right? Having someone else um, point those things out. Um, it says, I hear you, but no, you're not actually unique. Other people heard too. I want to mention two, two other things just by, by way of closing here. An artistic technique um, that I, I take to be rather new and interesting. Um, that the poet uses, and it's repetition. Remember I said, Tennyson got up every day and it hurt again, yeah? Here's a reading uh, from Balder, and I quote, Ah, 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 this is A-H, ah, 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 ah. That's 13. Thirteen times this poem says A-H space, A-H space, A-H space, and it's funny. It's hard for not to be funny. Maybe if I was a better reader, it wouldn't, you could make it, ah, or, but, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, you can't prolong a quiet cry of anguish, so it's just a bunch of cries of anguish, right? Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Um, I was in chapel on Saturday, though, and we sang this song, you're a good, good father, it's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And then it said, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. And I never heard that song before, but there we were singing it. And I think we probably repeated it nine times. <laughs> <laughs> they just went on and on with it. Um, we just started, and it was like, I mean, I'm critical as, as ever. And I was like, okay, that's probably, that's probably after the third one, which means nine times we'd sing that, that phrase. Um, I thought, that's probably enough, you guys. I mean, we're standing and, you know, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but actually, it was probably time six, which is time 18, that I, was, that I realized, oh, right, no, that's who I am. Yeah. Like, I'm not just saying this. Being, being loved by God isn't, like, a feature of my personality. It, it is the self. Like, that's who I am. And I honestly didn't realize it until time 18. Like, it took me that many times of... I was like, yeah, what a silly song. Boy, are we going to do this whole bunch of, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I'm like, oh, that is me, isn't it? No, and that's who he is. His quality is to have mercy, yeah? Um, he tries it again. He, he, he believes in this technique of repetition. He tries it one other time. Uh, in a poem, that, that, in this poem, after the kid dies, he says, farewell, 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 farewell. Farewell, farewell. Which seems to me a, about as accurate a poetic thing as can be said about death. I'm not sure the first five were enough. Um, uh, we'll leave it there because I want to have a couple minutes for, for questions and we only have um, five of them now if, if you have about this movement, this figure, this kind of poetry, I don't know. Yeah, what did he say? Did he have a third book? Uh, he did. He wrote um, three other books after these. Um, one is Sonnets on the War that he co-wrote with um, Alexander Smith, so the other spasmodic, and they kind of helped each other through it. It's an interesting book because they didn't take credit for whose sonnet was whose, and so you have no idea even now, like, they wrote them together, or half were his and half were his. Um, and then the other two books are also about war, England in wartime and home in time of war. So he never leaves this, this, this pain. Uh, his, first published, his first published poem before the book came out is also called Crazed. And it's imagining like this, this mental illness is, is a, his life 
verse. Somehow. Yeah. yeah, forgive me if I didn't catch it, but who was his great inspiration for his writing? Oh, that's a good question. Probably Shelley. Shelley. He's probably trying to, to be like Shelley, who was, if you know anything about his personal life, sort of a man of sorrows. Um, and he's probably challenge, challenge, channeling half of the sorrows that he actually talks about in there through what he takes to be the pain of someone else's life. Thank you. Gets him on the object. Yeah. Uh, maybe I missed it somewhere along the line, but how, you mentioned how if they were, you know, the movement was outselling, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, how did we, like, how did it get lost along the way? How did it get erased? I know. Yeah. yeah, it's completely gone. Well, part of it is a publishing initiative. Okay. Um, people, people said, you don't want to sell the stuff. Uh, it was plagiarized. I'll sue you if you republish Henry. It wasn't. All these charges were discredited wow. later, but they made it difficult for publishers to get behind them. Physicians came out and said... Like the writers made it difficult? Or the publishers, the, probably Matthew Arnold and Arthur Hugh Clough and his sort of cronies, made it difficult for publishers to keep publishing the work. Physicians came out and said, if you read this poem, your women will miscarry their babies. Oh my because the poetic <laughs> rhythm is such that their heart rates will get off and the babies will just drop. Like, so they actually have medical papers given. Spasmodic is a term, it's a medical term. Yeah. If you Google it now, it, it's in medical literature. And it means your, your heart rate is irregular, you're freaky, you're, you're a spaz, right? Um, and it comes from this debate that people were having. They said it's going to affect your heart, it's going to you know, keep the girls away from it, it'll hurt. Um, yeah, tricky, tricky, tricky stuff. And then they get attached to people like Marx and liberation fighters and communism, and so they don't get picked up during certain centuries and countries. You know, it's, it was a smear campaign that worked phenomenally well. Um, yeah, yeah, fantastic question. Anybody else you wonder? Yeah. Um, so, what's your opinion about like today's writings or how we use things to get through suffering? Oh man, that's a really good question too. It helps me, but I can't tell how strange that is. Um, to, to know that someone else has gone through something like it, right? It, we, read to, we read to feel that we're not alone. That's one of the reasons anyways, yeah. Um, and for whatever reason, misery loves company, uh, which I think is terrible. Like, you should hope that other people are happy, but you think, this is awful. Come on, try it. You know? <laughs> but I also, and here's the thing that the poem helps for me, I think, I think it's, it's validating in a certain way to put it in the nobility of a space like a poem. To say that um, all battles are real, whether it's depression or D-Day. You know what I mean? Like, that's an actual struggle, and it's not less important than anyone else's struggle. Because it doesn't involve whatever fighting, you know, like... Um, and I think that's, yeah, it's ennobling in a way, it kind of helps to make this, you seem like a soldier, and then you feel like you're doing something. Thanks for listening. Um, Sorry, yeah, 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 go ahead. Um, really briefly, uh, in your introduction, you mentioned um, the, uh, you know, poetry or art as a response to suffering, but um, yeah. you also made a really quick comment about, like, uh, suffering becoming art, and I think there's some parts of right. culture where there's this, uh, you know, a sick and twisted practice yeah. of making suffering into art. How do we respond to that? I, I completely agree. That's a, that's a, a strange phenomenon, and actually, I, I, because of time, I couldn't get to it here, but the book tries to address that. So, the poem that the guy's writing um, is, he, he needs to know everything in the world because they're nothing if not ambitious, these people. So he writes about patience and anger and etc. He's like, I know what those are like. I need to write about death. I don't really know what that's like. And so he's actually sort of praying, I want to experience death up close and personal so I can write about it in a real way. And then the kid dies. And he doesn't, he not only doesn't feel guilty about it, um, he doesn't even get the reward and he's kind of missing that. He's like, well, all that does is suck. Like, yeah. I can't. Like, I'm not turning that into art somehow. Yeah. And so, Baldurism gets used only very briefly as a term for wanting to artistically, like, affecting things in the real world for artistic ends. And it's that same kind of, I mean, the kind of people who wear certain you know, clothes around here. As the great prophets and stone temple pilots <laughs> said, take time with a wounded hand because it likes to heal, because the pain's kind of good. Yeah, but, it, but it's actually a cautionary tale. I mean, I'm holding it up as a kind of example, but it's a cautionary tale, like, hey, you can't take this too far. Don't let the art lead uh, your actual life. It should be always in the response mode. Yeah. Okay, thanks again.